My wife and I listened to the book, A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet, this past summer as we drove across the country to go to our daughter's wedding. I think the picture is going to come up in the middle. The book is by Becky Chambers, and it made us laugh out loud and cry sometimes. And it was a wonderful summer read. It's roughly the story of uh, the crew of the spaceship, the Wayfarer. And it cuts holes in the fabric of space, creating shortcuts to improve the commerce of the galactic community. It's not a fancy explorer ship. It's a road work crew, and they spend their whole lives living in a scrapped together ship doing run of the mill work that pays okay. The story is told from the perspective of Rosemary, who's in the center there. And she's a human in a landscape where humanity only exists as a remnant of a small group of folks who escaped from the earth as they had made the, the environment unlivable. But the lovely part about her stories is the humans have learned from their mistakes. And the crew includes a human captain named Ashby, two human techs named Kizzy and Jenks, a Sissix who is the Andrisk pilot, a Grum named Dr. Chef, a Cyanat pair called Ohan, the fuel um, chief is called Corbin, and an AI named Lovey. They stick together, they lean into their differences, they find a way to support one another, despite sometimes feeling uncomfortable. And Chambers' descriptions of how they respond to situations was both eye-opening, enjoyable, and it made me see some of my own interactions and how we behave in the world a little bit differently. Sci -sci good sci-fi does that. Because if we've never met an alien, we don't have any presuppositions of how they're gonna be. The main story follows storyline follows um, Rosemary and Sissix, who is the um, the Andrisk. And as they get to be friends, Rosemary notices that Sissix is always more cuddly and physically affectionate and touchy. Um, <clears throat> there's a picture coming up of Rosemary and Sissix uh, than humans are. And as they grow to be friends and really care about each other, they go to visit Sissix home planet one day. And Rosemary is surprised as she watches all of Sissick's family come out and they join, in, join into this giant puppy pile of rubbing and hugging and cuddling and some going off to couple all themselves. And Rome, Rosemary is surprised by the response in her body. And so, you know, she's like, oh, this is really different, but it works great for Andrew, so it shouldn't bother me. And she starts to think about how sterile and antiseptic the ship must feel with all the humans on it. And she starts to wonder what she can do to help uh, Sissix feel more comfortable when they're all back up on the ship. And so they start having some real conversations about the disparities and how what feels comfortable and the ways they can bridge expectations so that everybody's needs are being met. Rosemary doesn't stop being human. She just adjusts her behavior in order to be more welcoming to someone that she wants to be in relationship with. That's what I love about this genre, because it offers different ways for us to see ourselves and see how we could be different in the world and live into the values that we have. There's a story of two fish swimming along and all of a sudden an older fish comes swimming from the other direction and he looks over and says, how's the water boys? And the two, two younger fish keep swimming for a few more minutes and finally one looks the other and says, what the heck is water? <laughs> Many of us exist without ever noticing the water that we're swimming in. But you know, we are all kind of in a new moment in history. There's been so many tremendous changes, even coming back and seeing all the technology that's here at USG now, USG now. And there's so many changes going on in our country and in our world and even and on our earth. And even definitions of church are kind of changing as we kind of figure out how to readjust coming out of a pandemic and beginning to live into endemic where things are always kind of shifting and we're never quite sure. We know that the only permanent in life is change. And we also know that right now we can feel it maybe a little bit more than we have in the past. It might open up things we've never imagined if we give ourselves the space. I know about, <laughs> 
things you never imagined because I grew up in a working class Catholic community and I never even suspected that I might be queer till I was nearly 40. I honestly thought they used beautiful women in all the advertising because everybody was attracted to beautiful women, right? And that that crush that I had on my Jazzercise instructor, well, that was normal. Maybe not. <laughs> but even when I'd opened myself up enough to go to seminary, I still didn't see what I didn't see. Um, a young seminarian at my home church invited me out to dinner with some of her friends when she learned that I'd been admitted to Meadville Lombard Theological School. It was exciting and I was nervous, and especially as I realized that everybody else at the dinner was gay. I, uh, I finally felt, knew what it felt like to be in a minority. <laughs> when I mentioned this observation to the intern, she kind of stared at me like I was from outer space. It was just a room full of people. I have to say I'm still embarrassed by the memory because I realized in that moment that it was me othering the other people in the room that I was bringing something with me that didn't exist for any of them. It's hard to see the water in our bowl. Some of you may remember that I was your in, the intern here at UUSG from 2010, 2011. An internship is one of those places that breaks you up, breaks open one version of reality and kind of moves you into another. And this was a warm and wonderful and welcoming place that helped me do that breaking open, turning everything around and figuring out what it meant to be a minister in a, and serve a church in that way. Reverend Lindsay was my mentor and she challenged me again and again to see myself as a different way in the world, which was really helpful. I was rich and rewarding and I'm so grateful for that time. All life is that journey of transitioning from one reality to another one whether we're consciously aware of it or not. And as you use Unitarian Universalist, we have been trying to transition into being a more welcoming and open reality that opens to all kinds of perspectives, you know, and lived realities for a very long time. I mean, I've preached many a welcoming sermons in many churches throughout the years, and it's always some, some variation of reminding us to live into our values because it's good for us. But you know, this vision has been preached at UU churches for 30, 40, 50 years. And Sunday mornings are still the most segregated hour in the week. And it's not because we're bad people. It's not because we haven't tried, Lord knows we've tried. <clears throat> and it's not because we don't value diversity in the abstract, we do. It might be because we might start at the wrong end. We might start thinking that we have to get people that we see as other into our pews. We want people with different shades of melanin and different pronouns, maybe different family recipes, but we really want them to fit into what is here already. <clears throat> the question is, <clears throat> we all give up a little bit to become part of a community, but how much should we have to give up? At my first UU church, there was a huge culture of classical music, really strong. And I was more of a folk and bluegrass girl, but I would nod as people went and on ecstatically about some piece of music that I was just like, eh. <laughs> I did my best to pass and find a way to fit into this group of seekers who aligned with my spiritual journey. And you know, that's normal. To some extent, we all give up a little bit. We do give and take to get it part of any community, but I think there's a limit that any of us should have to give up to feel that we belong. Because as a confession, you use often, often want to be the cool people with the readily apparent diversity. But we also want the church to remain comfortable in the way it's always been. So please join us, but don't expect that we're gonna make too many changes. I've wrestled with this at previous churches where people of color, even young people with a lot of jewelry or tattoos come in and they're surrounded by well-wishing people who just think if they just make them feel welcome enough, they'll stay. But often that welcome can only feel skin deep. And the folks that are willing to give up some part of themselves in order to claim this kinship, they stay and they stay on. But others come for a few services and then just realize, hmm, the whole of themselves is not going to fit here and they move on. 
I mean, I thought I had to become a minister in order to have bluegrass played at my services. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on with all of this? Why is it so difficult to create the community we say we want? Academic and poet Bayo Akomolafe describes a new way of seeing what he calls post-activism, decolonialization, and transracial communities. He's known for saying that times are urgent. Let us slow down. The times are urgent. Let us slow down. Who doesn't want to slow down? That caught my attention. I started reading, reading up on him and trying to figure out what he was talking about. He comes out of Nigeria, and Akamalafi sees blackness and whiteness differently than we see it here usually. He sees whiteness as a field, as a perspective and way of being in the world that flattens and takes away the rich contours of life, and it allows people to feel safe and in control. He says it's about believing that if we can control life enough, we can feel comfortable all the time. And it holds within that a judgment of difference of anything that might disrupt that prom promise of sanctuary. Becky Chambers wrote, if you believe you have control, then you believe you're at the top. And if you're at the top, then people who aren't like you, well, they got to be someplace lower, right? That kind of fits my experience of whiteness as I've gained more understanding and uh, vision as I've gotten older and done a lot of work. Because blackness is a field that resists that flattening, according to Kamalafe. Blackness pushes us for the fullness of life, for all of the emotions, not just the easy ones. It's an acknowledgement that life is hard, no matter what the advertisers might be promising. Now, he acknowledges that we all live in bodies that are recognized as black or white or brown. And that recognition changes our experiences of what the world is gonna be. But he also says we can each choose which field we are gonna participate in, whether it's the illusion of control or the resistance to that control. As everyone born in this country is born into whiteness as the default, even if that means code switching or acting white to fit in. And whiteness is the lie that says, if we're just good enough, if we just follow the rules, if we just know the right people, if we just get the right products or drive the right cars, we can control our lives and stay safe. Akamalafi says that um, people with darker skin, more melanin, can also inhabit that white field. And that his home country of Nigeria very much buys into that whiteness of keeping everything calm and flatten it, even though it is, has the highest per capita population of dark-skinned people. I believe it's what's driving those folks out there to try to ban books and restrict history from being taught because they believe the lie that they never have to feel bad and they're working with all their might to maintain a system of comfortable ignorance. Okomalafi's work opened up a huge place of possibility for me, because if whiteness and blackness can be inhabited by anyone, if they are a perspective and a worldview rather than a defined, unchangeable part of who I am, then that means I have the choice. Any of us has the choice which reality we're going to live into, which reality we're going to support. We can identify those places that we act from whiteness as a flattening and keeping everything calm. And we can embrace the wildness, the wholeness, the fullness of our whole beings and know that that's okay. Because it takes a lot of energy to press down emotions. And it's no wonder our country is filled with so many angry, frustrated, and depressed people. But what if we stopped? What if we accepted the whole of ourselves? and the whole of the human beings around us and stopped trying to make them be like us. And that's kind of hard, but here's an example in real life of what that flat flattening can look like. A person I know belongs to a woman's chorus and they've been trying to become more diverse. They've been working hard at it over the last few years. They um, formed committees and talking circles. They read a ton of books and watched movies, and they even changed their bylaws to specifically name that they would play. They would sing more songs written by women of color. 
And they made some great progress. Some, a few African-American women and women of color have joined the chorus and they've stuck. They've, they haven't just come in and left right away, they've stayed on. But at a recent rehearsal, the conductor invited them all to go off book, to follow her as she led them through the song because it was written by an African-American woman and she wanted to break it out of the tightly written word and just have a little bit more life flow into it. And she got tremendous pushback from the white women in the chorus. One even shamed her because she was doing one little um, section of it, the rhythm was off. And so it was so much pushback that she threw in the towel and said, fine, we'll just do it as written, never mind. But afterwards, when she was looking back at it, she realized that the black women in the chorus had been saying, yeah, let's go for it. Let's sing it off book. And she had, she had caved in without realizing that she had allies right there that could have supported that. Because whiteness in the chorus expected everything to be rule bound so that you knew what it was supposed to sound like and that it would sound like that. But blackness resisted. Blackness wanted to say, let's see what else could happen. Even at the expense of sounding a little different, it could still be good. All of us have that choice that we can make in our lives, in our church communities, in our own lives. What are we gonna choose? The onward flow of life offers all kinds of opportunities to shift perspectives, to step into discomfort, to open alternative ways of being together and understanding the world. But you have to decide if it's something you want to do. Because it's not about being extra welcoming. And it's not about wanting people who feel comfortable with you, because then you're going to pretty much stay the same. I think it's about freeing current members who are around us from the shoulds that keep everything calm and predictable. One of my theories is that white people have loved jazz music and hip hop and other forms of black music because they bring in the whole spectrum of humanity, whereas a lot of white music wants to keep it in a good tight rhythm. <laughs> What if our congregation stopped worrying about how many people of different skin tones or genders or even ages came in the door and started making space for the whole fuller range of human experience, even with the people that are right here? What if we start living so fully and joyfully or embracing the sorrow and the pain that exists in every single life that everybody felt they could bring their whole human experience here? Can't you imagine? that everybody outside are gonna go, I want that too. <laughs> I wanna bring my place where I can bring my whole self, where I can be alive and I don't have to fit into whatever the box is. Maybe it's as simple as, I don't have to drive a Prius to the Unitarian Church. <laughs> I can drive whatever I want. <laughs> it doesn't start out there. It starts in here. It starts by feeling and living that resistance in our own bodies. Noticing the time we shut down ourselves in order to fit down, fit in and wondering what would happen if I brought that part I'm sh shutting down. It might change things, might allow somebody else to bring the fullness of them that they had been shutting down. You never know what you're gonna start when you start living your own life more full. We are all a bunch of aliens on a big blue planet sliding through space. Each of us brings unique gifts and perspectives. And if we start embracing our own alien qualities, that might be the first step in embracing everybody else's. I'm gonna close with words of a famous alien you might know with pointy ears. Live long and prosper. Visit us at uusg.org.